Scooter, one of the most, uh, I guess, not, not I don't know, I don't even know if I want to say traumatic, but one of the most memorable times for me was the idea of senior year going into UCLA, realizing that the friends I had and were so close to, I had maybe 10 or 15 friends. Mm -hmm. it, upon the realization, even at 17, going on 18, that these friendships really wouldn't last, even though that beautiful golden summer tries to seduce you into saying something <laughs> otherwise. Yeah. Uh, was, was that a main attraction for you just to tap into maybe who you were way back when? Is that one of the ingredients behind why this was a, a very appealing project for you? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, being a teenager and leaving high school, during high school, you know, you're so full of hormones and um, it's such a stressful time for you. You're still trying to figure out what being, trying to figure out if you're even an adult yet, which you don't, not, you, you, you aren't <laughs> um, at that age. Um, and the fact that like your, uh, your classmates, your friends, they're your lifeline. They're everything to you. Yeah. Um, your parents don't understand you. The school system is just a pressure upon you. Um, and when you separate from that time, kind of to your, your point, it's like, it can feel like life and death. Um, and those are the stakes that you feel emotionally, I think, at that age. And then with the approach to this movie, yeah, absolutely. I mean, that's what happens if the stakes are life and death. That's a fascinating place to start a horror movie, in my opinion, is. I think on an aesthetic level, can you just talk about me, or maybe it's superficial even asking this, but just the actual item itself, how much thought mm. was was put into it because I, I i really it's something that that really stuck with my mind was there a lot more thought than put into it or was it just sort of by happenstance regarding building that no we i mean we had to put a lot of thought into it just to understand what it was going to be we spent like damien wrote that into the script and it was it was always this orb and there was you know different pieces of it that were made from wood and iron and all these different places and we kind of wanted to dive down into that a little bit deeper and figure out why that was the case, um, what this machine does or this mechanism does. So working with our production designer, uh, Richard Simpson, a lot of that conversation became about his love of ancient civilizations and just these, um, these items and these elements that people find that feel well beyond the time. When you track it down to thousands of years ago, it just seems like it's um, you know, far more mechanically sound than it should be for that era. Uh, he's always been fascinated by that. So that sort of became our place to start was what if this object, if you could track it through different eras, um, this object has always existed and never existed. It's, it's as infinite as time and space. Um, so each concurrent layer has its own language um, and it's made of a different substance. Um, so we've taken from, you know, from Latin and from um, Aramaic and uh, a few other different languages and created this sort of like our own alien language um it's not necessarily alien it could be sort of anything um and then built it so each different layer when it's spinning it speaks to itself and that's what opens up this sort of like alternate reality sort of not, not necessarily a portal but you know portalish sort of existence but uh yeah that that's sort of the the inkling behind it was that it is this lovecraftian object that has existed uh, as long as the Big Bang, you know what I mean? Yeah. Can you also speak to the fact that the friendship game is not just an A to B horror thriller, mm -hmm. meaning every single uh, cinephile will will have his or her imp interpretation regarding what happens to the ending. If the object itself is a force of evil or a force of neutrality, maybe there is value added in being honest with people. Can you just talk about the ambiguity behind your film? It's not just a um, a surface level uh, narrative. Yeah, and I mean, thank you for thank you for that. Um, that is something that we actively tried to incorporate. The, the ambiguity, I think, is is important to the story. Um, it isn't, you know, this evil demigod that is attacking these children, um, these children, these teenagers. Um, it is literally just a mechanism. It isn't sentient. It just is triggered by your deepest desire. And then just a game board comes about. So it, it really is based on not necessarily like a creature feature, like a monster in that sense. It is about the monster within. So everything sort of sparks from character. You know, if your friendships don't survive the game, neither do you. That puts all the onus on the characters themselves. And that's where the horror comes from. It comes from an emotional place. Um, yeah. So, you know, that becomes a sort of elevated genre movie, not necessarily 
as you were calling it, an A to B um, horror movie for sure. Yeah, I, thank, I you, also, thank you for noticing that. That's really yeah, nice. no, no worries. I also liked, um, you know, obviously from the uh, uh, from Cobra Kai, I'm a huge fan of Peyton, but mm. I, I really liked your assemblage of your ensemble. You for you have to make sure that they're just not actors on a page that they actually get along with each other. But there's also that tipping point where you know there is a level of even though they're close, there could always be that edge where tension can. Can enter how do you do that as far as mm. putting all those you said game board i'm not saying they're pieces but how do you put all those elements together and making sure they work together not just as friends but as uh, counterpoints to each other as well yeah um i think a lot of that's in damien's script um damien ober's script definitely has all of that stuff sort of woven within um and it's what attracted to me to it in the first place was that it was a character piece um that happened to have all this wild alternate universe horror stuff um, but with the cast themselves, I mean, casting is to me the most important part of any movie. Um, and it took us a while to kind of land our cast. But it, it, I like to give the cast themselves the freedom to completely inhabit the character. So when I'm doing casting, I'm not looking for a specific thing. Um, I'm just looking to be surprised by what they're giving me. And if it is something that feels organic and full of life, that's where I want to go. And then I want them to just, you know, collaborate in a way where they give me that and I just follow the, um, or at least lead the, uh, the emotion of the story, the arc. Um, and our cast ended up being really good friends. Like they're still good friends together. And I think you can see that on screen. It's pretty cool. And you're cool with other, other uh, audience members or viewers to have actually have a negative um, take on the interpretation because it's, I guess it's all yeah. the world state, right? So it's okay. Yeah, it's all, it's all good. I mean, I've had this conversation with multiple people is that, you know, once you, when you're making a movie, it's a, it's a living breathing process. It's, you know, you're casting people. It's just sort of luck of the draw. You're casting people who's, who's available for your crew your locations, the budget, the time, all the things. It's just a living, breathing animal. And your job as a director is to sort of guide that and control sort of where it's going to go. But it is it is an exercise in madness because you can't control it. It just does its thing. So when you're finished making a movie, it's as though you've birthed it into the world. And now it just lives its own way. So it doesn't belong to me anymore. It belongs to the audience. And however they want to engage with it, that's their right to do. If they like it, they like it. If they don't like it, they don't like it. If they have different opinions on um, how the movie is told or where the story goes or you know any of that stuff, that's exciting to me because it's because the movie is no longer mine. The movie is its own child and it's doing its own thing and it's growing with the audience. And that that to me is it is exciting and cool. I just like when I hear people's different takes on on films uh especially on on my films and yeah i just i find that really fascinating i, I like that part of the process so after watching this movie there, there's actually a sequence in them uh, obviously you know this but where peyton's character she's looking at a mirror and she's mm -hmm. disoriented but the bottom line is she's actually by looking at either her reflection or where she is there's a she's taking a long hard look at herself and mm -hmm. after watching this film, I'm going to go check out Hollow in the Land. And if you could look at these two films and mm -hmm. look at yourself in the mirror, is there a connecting thread between these two films? Or have you, do you do so much work anyway and you're moving forward that you're not going to put yourself on that couch? Uh, that's a fascinating question. Um, and definitely one I haven't had before. Uh, the, I don't know if I look in the mirror over both films. I mean, they, they both have, um, a sense of uh, being abandoned, a, a feeling for the lead characters of feeling abandoned and having to come to terms with that. Um, there, there's definitely a theme there um, within within my own, you know, my own life, um, having like divorced parents and all that sort of stuff. Um, that has come through in my work a lot, uh, for sure. But I don't know. I think I think a lot of it is really, if I could look in the mirror, it is about I think in general, my movies might be about forgiveness um, and they might be just as much about forgiving the people around you um, as much as forgiving yourself um, and just realizing that you are flawed and you are human. Um, if, I, if I could take anything away, it's probably that. But you haven't seen Hollow, so you don't 100% know what I'm talking about, but 
Well, that's, I will get, it's a big part of it. I will get back to you in about a year and a half and I'll give you my, my impressions <laughs> yeah, regarding exactly. if, you're, if you're accurate. Now, uh, very quickly, a couple of uh, final questions. You could have made the friendship game, we're talking about A to B, you could have made it more palatable and pleasing and just round the board, but you didn't want to do that. I mean, can you just mm -hmm. talk about that aesthetic choice? Because you're making, you're actually making it more specified and there is an, this bittersweet ache to your movie when you're watching it, because if you're really thinking beyond the surface, talk about that as opposed, as opposed to making it just a violent exercise coming of age thing that will appeal to mm -hmm. a mass audience, because that's a huge fork in the road here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I don't, I don't, I mean, I'm not super interested in heroes and in villains. I'm, I'm more interested in the nuance between. Um, I love a good splatter movie. I love a, a good creature feature. Um, but I think my favorite films kind of don't find their genre. They're, they're somewhere in between. And it, and it is about the nuance of human flaw um, and the fact that we don't have everything figured out and there isn't a black and white winner, loser, um, hero, villain. It's that we're all complex creatures trying to figure things out. And I think to the earlier conversation around forgiveness, I think that's where I stand as a, as a human. Um, and then that transfers into being an artist is that I wanna tell stories about flawed people and I want people to understand them um, to sort of like destigmatize uh, being, making mistakes, you know, and, and being flawed and trying to, you know, live your life as, not in the sense that you need to be sort of taken down a peg for making a mistake. It's, it's, you make mistakes, you grow from it. It's the only way we grow from it. Um, so I feel like that's where a lot of my storytelling comes from, for sure. So in, in that sense, this movie is a cosmic horror movie, for sure. Um, we do lean into the genre, but I think at its core is heart and, and humanity. Um, and I don't, I never thought I'd be talking about such a deep exploration on, on the characters on, on a horror movie, but that's, those are the, the projects that I'm the most interested in. Um, so yeah, why, why isn't it a straightforward A to B? I'm just, I'm not super interested in that, to be honest. My final question is a superficial question, but I wanted to ask you, you're talking about movies that you appreciate. They don't have a specific genre. They're finding their way through the narrative and that's the, that's the beauty of it. Can you name one of your all time favorite movies and what is it about this specific film? That resonates with you. I I could say as a filmmaker, but just as a as a just nerdy movie fan, you know as well. Yeah, Most yeah. Mortally, yeah, yeah. Oh man, I mean, there's a thousand different movies um, that I love. I I really love a good drama. Drama. Um, I think, mm. you know, There Will Be Blood is one of the best movies of all time. Um, I'm a I'm a big PTA fan. Um, but as far as like a real favorite film. That's a really tough question. And then as far as like genre is concerned, I think it, it comes with what my mood is at the time, I think, you know. Um, for for this film, you know, I, I really like what Ari Aster's doing. Um, I really like what Robert Robert Eggers is doing. I love like It Follows. Um, there's this wave of Americana horror that is thoughtful and character focused um, and is an elevated genre movie like that those are the movies that are really attracting me currently the wailing i think is an incredible movie um it's korean and it's so surprising if you haven't seen the wailing like it, it jumped into my top 10 um last year when i saw it for the first time and i was just yeah i was staggered by it but yeah i love audition i think is the first movie i ever like first um like japanese or asian horror movie i'd ever watched in film school audition Taka, uh, Taka, uh, Takashi Miike's movie. Yeah, Mike. Mike's great. Yeah. Oh man, it it just it dropped me on my knees. It was so I was so scared, and I was just so interested in what was going on. And I started gobbling up all that stuff, like um, getting into the old boy and and the whole yeah. Korean movement. And man, yeah, there's just there's a lot of those elevated pictures that come from a place of heart and come from a place of of uh, character that I can I could watch forever. You know, 
th those yeah. are those are definitely the influences that I love. Sure. Thank you so much for your time. After watching Howl in the Land, will I have to wait another couple of years before your next film, or are you going to go on that Takashi Miike clip and have a movie every year? <laughs> you know, because um, I fear after if I end up really enjoying Howl in the Land, I'm going to say when when is your next movie coming out? So yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, we'll see. I mean, we'll see who gives me money. That's really the, <laughs> that's the long and short of an indie movie, right? Yeah. Um, or an indie film career, but. Yeah, there's a lot in the, in the pipeline right now. So hopefully, hopefully one takes. Okay, looking forward to our next one. Thank you so much for your time. Yes, thank you. Appreciate it.